What if the answer to your deepest question was right in front of you and you couldn't see it? Could it be possible to walk with God and not fully recognize him? Why did Jesus choose Philip? In this video, we're talking about the disciple Philip. We'll go over his character profile, the moment that Jesus called him to follow him, one of his key moments in the Bible, and then we'll talk about life after Jesus' ascension and his death. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Autumn and I make content to change the world through faith-driven and brave conversations. This video is a part of a series I called Disciples of Christ, where I deep dive into the lives of the 12 disciples. So if that's something you're interested in, make sure you hit that like button, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on a single story. Let's get into it. That seemed cooler in my head. Okay. All right. So Philip's name in Greek is actually Philippos. And again, I've already stated this name, places. Just work with me here. The meaning of that in Greek is actually lover of horses or he who loves horses. The name Philippos was actually really popular among the Greeks, especially the Macedonians. It was probably popular because King Philip II of Macedonia, of course, was named Philip. Um, he was the father of Alexander the Great. The region that Philip lived in at the time was also being reigned and oversaw by one of King Herod the Great's sons, whose name was also Philip. This was a prestigious name that carried a lot of significance in the culture during that time. It signifies someone of noble bearing in society. Philip didn't necessarily come from a noble background, but there is speculation that he did come from the upper echelon of society. I'm already starting already. Let me stop. <laughs> so there was speculation that he was a part of the upper class. His name might reflect a certain cultural aspiration or significance in his community. The Bible doesn't really focus on the significance or the meaning of Philip's name, but like I said before, Names are a pretty big deal in the Bible, and they often held aspirational qualities or meaning. So with Philip's name, meaning lover of horses, it could be interpreted symbolically as someone like a rider of horses was driven and steadfast in sharing the good news of the gospel. Interestingly, Philip's name is not Jewish or Hebraic. It's speculation that Philip was a Hellenistic Jew. This is a way of referring to a Jewish believer who was of a Greek speaking background and upbringing. Philip had this knack for engaging with Gentiles and people who spoke Greek. In fact, Greek was probably his primary language. He made them feel comfortable and accepted. Um, it was almost as if he had an in with the Greek speaking people or the non-Jewish people. So that possibly could be one of the main factors that Jesus saw already in Philip when he first met him. And that's probably why he called him. Of course, we don't know why Jesus chose him fully. Only God knows that. If you look at it, the Greeks often approached Philip or Andrew when they wanted to meet Jesus. Philip did have a wife and children. It doesn't really say in the Bible what his occupation was, but given the area that he lived in, he was most likely a fisherman as well. Philip also lived in Bethsaida along with Andrew and Simon Peter. So they could have known each other before all three were called to follow Jesus. Some positive traits about Philip is that he was brave, he was curious, and he was evangelistic. Philip had a heart for introducing people to Jesus. You can read this in John chapter 1 verses 45 to 46. It says, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? From these verses, you can actually tell that Philip was very well versed in the scriptures, particularly the Old Testament. Philip had come to the conclusion that Jesus was the Messiah through what was written through the prophets in the Old Testament and also what Moses said in Deuteronomy. The Messiah's birth through a virgin was actually detailed in Isaiah. The fact that he was born in Bethlehem was detailed in Micah. The Messiah's lineage and his descendants from Abraham was detailed in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. The fact that the Messiah was going to be from the tribe of Judah 
was detailed in Genesis chapter 49 verse 10 and that he would be from the line of David in 2 Samuel and of course Jesus ministry was actually detailed in several places in the Old Testament one being that he would be a prophet like Moses and that is in Deuteronomy chapter 18 of course Philip knowing these scriptures being well versed in the Old Testament um, probably hearing people talk about Jesus way beforehand. He probably heard the tidbits about who Jesus was, that he was from Nazareth and all that stuff. And so he used the facts that he had presented in front of him to come to the conclusion that Jesus really is the Messiah. And so he was very eager eager to bring his friend Nathaniel to Jesus so that Nathaniel can also meet the Messiah. This brings me to a negative trait of Philip in that he was very pragmatic. A pragmatic person is a person who deals with situations and problems by focusing on practical approaches and solutions. They are really fact driven people rather than ideal driven people. Philip was grounded in reality and lacked faith at times when he saw Jesus performing miracles or anytime Jesus showed his supernatural capabilities as Christ. This is actually demonstrated in the feeding of the 5,000, which I read about when I talk about Andrew, and you can go see that video through this link up above. But of course, watch this first, then go watch that. And go ahead and watch Simon Peter's episode two while you're at it. Again, watch this first. Now, let's get into the moment that Jesus called Philip to become one of his disciples. Okay, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't really go into detail about the moment that Jesus called Philip to follow him as a disciple. Um, the Gospel of John is actually the only gospel in the Bible that actually goes into detail about that moment. Why that is, uh, there are some theories out there. Go ahead and do your own research and maybe even leave it down in the comment section, but I'm not gonna get into all that. Just know the man was called. This is detailed in John chapter one, verses 43 through 46. It says the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Here we can start to learn some things from Philip as a person. The first thing is his willingness to follow. Philip's immediate response to Jesus' call suggests that he had a heart to follow the Messiah. And he did so without any hesitation. He didn't question it. He was just like, this is the Messiah. Why wouldn't I go with him? He didn't demand any explanations or any signs or miracles or wonders. He didn't need to really see Jesus do a miracle in order to know that he was the Messiah. Philip demonstrates the importance to be open and ready to follow when God calls us, even if we don't even fully know where we're going or where we're being led to. Come on, y'all. It's Jesus. I mean, you don't need to know all the facts of what God is calling you to. Just know that that is God and he's calling you. So get up and get moving. Another lesson we can take is that he was very connected to the community. Like I said before, Philip is from the same city as Andrew and Peter. So with Andrew going around talking about that, he found the Messiah, you know, Peter having that, you know, whole epiphany with him following Jesus, word is spreading around. Things about Jesus are being said. And so Philip being in the upper class, he probably was associated with a lot of people. Um, he had, he was really in with the non-Jewish people as well, the Gentiles. And so he got all the tea all the time. So he probably already had it in, he, because of his connection with the community, he already had it in his head that this is the Messiah. Um, and so for Jesus to approach him and ask him to come follow me, he's like, why not? Okay, this is the ultimate teacher. Our community influences our spiritual journey. Philip's openness to Jesus may have been a result to his connection with the community and other people also seeking the Messiah at that time. We can learn the importance of walking with people who encourages our spiritual journey. This moment also reflects Philip's evangelistic qualities. As soon as he was called by Jesus, he immediately went to go find Nathaniel and bring him to Jesus also. He was willing to share the love and the good news of the Messiah being here and ready to bring salvation and peace to the world. We learned that once we experience Christ for ourselves, we are called to share that experience with others and also help them to experience Jesus as well. Like Philip, we should respond with come and see, period. 
Now, I do want to take the time to highlight some things that we learned about Jesus himself in this moment as well. The first off is that Jesus seeks us personally. Jesus sought out Philip. Philip didn't come seeking for Jesus, even though he probably heard about him beforehand. Jesus approached Philip first. The text says that Jesus found Philip, showing that Jesus intentionally sought Philip out. This illustrates Jesus's personal approach to calling his disciples. He doesn't wait for us to come to him. He comes to us. Jesus takes the initiative to reach out to us, whether we are intentionally seeking him or not. He is looking for you, inviting you to be in a closer and deeper relationship with him. Jesus's call for Philip was actually pretty simple. The only thing the man said was, follow me. There was no complex instructions. It just was a simple invitation for Philip to um, follow him. The call of Jesus is simple yet profound. He doesn't demand that we have everything figured out before he calls us to follow him. The first step is to trust and to be obedient. Like I said before, we don't have to understand every detail of the calling. We don't have to know where we're going. And I know that's a scary thought. Like I want us to know if this is going to end up badly for me or not. But when it comes to Jesus calling you to follow him, it starts with trust that he has greater works for you. And of course, your obedience to the calling. We simply need to follow where he leads. Another important thing we see of Jesus is that he knows our potential. Jesus chooses Philip knowing exactly who he is and where he is. But more importantly, he chooses Philip for what he will become. Even though we don't know much about Philip at this point in the Bible, and Philip is not really talked about much in the Bible, Jesus sees beyond his current state and sees who he will become. Jesus knows us deeply, including our weaknesses, our strengths, and our potential. When he calls us, it is not based on our current state. It is based on what he can do through and in us. You don't need to feel inadequate or unworthy of his call. All you need to do is trust and obey. Now, let's go over one of Philip's key moments in the Bible and what we can take away from that. Like I said before, there's not really that many key moments in the Bible with Philip. But the Gospel of John, again, is what I'm going to be reading from to really highlight a key moment of Philip because he goes into more detail on that matter. Um, in particular, this will be John 14 uh, verses 7 through 11. And this time I am reading the amplified version of this Bible because I feel like it just um, gives us more context and more detail for what we're about to talk about. So this exchange takes place in the upper room in Jerusalem after the Last Supper. Jesus is basically giving a farewell speech and preparing his disciples for what is about to happen next, which is his crucifixion, his resurrection and his ascension. He comforts them by explaining that he is preparing a place for them in heaven and that the Holy Spirit will be their advocate here on earth for them to do mighty works. In verse seven, you see that Jesus reveals who he is to the disciples yet again. He says, if you had really known me, you would have also known my father. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Now, this is not the first time that Jesus basically reveals who he is and reveals the oneness with the father. I'll put in several places on the screen where he's actually said this before to the disciples. So they've been hearing it for the past three years. OK, so there, this is not the first time they're, they're hearing of this. In the verses before verse seven, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Despite this powerful declaration that Jesus once again tells his disciples, Philip still asks for a more tangible revelation of the Father. In verse 8, it says, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and then we'll be satisfied. In verse 9 through 11, Jesus says, and I'm laughing because, like, this is gangster. Ew, gangster? Okay. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you for so long a time, and you do not know me yet, Philip, nor recognize clearly who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not say on my own initiative or authority. But the Father, abiding continually in me, does his works, his attesting miracles and acts of power. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe me because of the very works themselves, 
which you have witnessed. So Jesus had been performing miracles. Jesus had been telling the disciples that he, if you see him, you see the father. He had been already describing his oneness with the father. Philip was there at these miracles with the feeding of the 5,000. Um, the miracle he did at the wedding in Cana, he has been through it all. And so for Philip to come and ask again, show us the father. Jesus was like, bruh. Did you not just spend three years with me, Philip? Like, come on now. Now, I did come off a little bit judgmental right there. And so I know you did too. So don't even try to act like it. But so before we judge this, we do have to realize the uh, emotional impact of this moment. Okay. This is a deeply emotional setting right now. Jesus is preparing his disciples for the fact that he'd be leaving them physically, but he's also reassuring him that he will be in their presence through the Holy Spirit. The disciples, however, as you can see with Philip's response are still confused and very anxious. They believe that the Messiah is there to redeem them from the political reign of the Roman empire to finally give them peace and salvation. And Jesus just rolled up in here talking about, he's about to leave them and the mission has not done. We're still under Roman authority. What are you talking about? You're going to leave. Most of them probably still felt inadequate, unready to really do the mission that God was telling them that they would need to be doing. It's almost like when you're about to leave the nest after being under your parents' house for so long, you don't really know if you can handle the responsibility that you've seen your parents do, or if you even want to, let's be honest. And of course, Philip was a fact-based person. And so for Jesus to say that he, that they have seen the father, he's like, where he at though? Where he at? Make it make sense, Jesus. Make it make sense. I don't see the man. I don't see the man. But I do want to pause and really um, leave you guys with the question that I'm going to be answering for myself um, as I do my own um, personal Bible study and talk with God. It's this. Do you know who Jesus is? How do you see Jesus? This passage brings up a larger discussion of Jesus' identity, his relationship with the Father, and the promise of eternal life. Jesus in this moment is explaining his divine nature and the deep unity between himself and God. This is actually crucial to the theology of the Trinity. Now, there are many videos on the Holy Trinity, so you could go out and watch those. To be honest, this is something that I still don't understand, the Holy Trinity I'm, I'm referring to. Um, I've watched many videos and I still don't have an understanding. And so, you know, I'm going to make sure that I do my due diligence to speak with God so that he can bring clarity on the matter for me. Um, because this is actually knowing who Jesus is and, you know, his relationship with the father and, um, his divine nature is very important to your spiritual journey. And so if you don't have an understanding of that, then you probably don't have an understanding of the majority of the Bible and just God's relationship with you. Now, there are some lessons that we can actually learn from Philip in this moment. Philip asks Jesus to show him the father. This just reflects that Philip had a deep desire for understanding. I noticed that as I read the Bible more and I start to learn more about Jesus is that I still have this deep longing desire to know God more fully than what I think that I know about him now. Philip was genuinely seeking revelation and clarity on who Jesus was in his relationship with the father. Like Philip, we may have sincere questions and things that we want more clarity on. And like I said before, we all have a longing to have a deeper understanding of God, even if we don't even fully grasp the truth that is standing literally right in front of us. As in Philip's case, Jesus was literally standing right in front of him. So the moral of that portion is bring your questions to God. Jesus actually says those who ask will receive. And so if you just come to God with your questions, no matter how small or big they are, he wants a deeper relationship with you. He wants you to know him more deeply. He wants you to form that bond. So bring your questions to him. It's just a personal conversation between you and him. I'm not going to know about your questions. This moment also just reflects our, again, our human limitations and our misunderstanding of God sometimes. Philip had been walking with Jesus for three years. Jesus had been performing miracles. Jesus had even stated that through him, you see the father multiple times. And yet Philip still did not fully grasp the death of Jesus's divine identity in his unity with the father. This just shows our human limitations of understanding when it comes to the mysteries of God. 
even as a believer, we still struggle to come to terms to certain spiritual truths. Like I said before, even I still don't even fully understand the Holy Trinity of God. And I think we all can agree that we really don't understand the true nature of God sometimes. Again, this is just a reminder that we should seek wisdom and have patience in our faith. God will provide those answers eventually, especially if he sees that we are eager to seek deeper revelation of who he is. And you can seek deeper understanding through Jesus. I encourage you to read more about Jesus, learn about his teachings, dive deep into Jesus, and through Jesus, you see the Father. Philip also was very bold with his questioning. Um, I think I always picture this moment as like when you're in the classroom and the teacher asks a question or the teacher say something and then it's just dead silent and then you got that one student that's like, um, what? And then like there's like a breath, like a breath of fresh air throughout the whole class because like everybody else was just like, oh, I'm so glad somebody was like vocally said this question. Or I'm so glad somebody vocally said that they don't understand because me, myself, I don't understand what that person was talking about either. And so we can actually learn from Philip's boldness that, yes, come to God with your questions. Though his understanding was incomplete, he had the openness and the trust and the boldness to ask questions, even in the presence of the others. He had no fear that his question might seem elementary or that, you know, he might be the odd one out that still don't understand the question. Nine times out of ten, nobody knows what is going on in the situation and we just need that one person to vocally say that nobody knows what's going on so that we can know what's going on you know what i'm saying and so learn from philip and be bold and come to god with your questions and even even in the presence of others and if you're in public and you speaking with god as i often do people probably look at me like i'm crazy but uh, it is what it is but as i am often in public sometimes praying to god come to god with them questions still even in the midst of others. Now, like always, there are some lessons we can learn from Jesus' response and his interaction and, and what he said, of course, because he is an everlasting teacher. In this moment, Jesus corrects P Philip, of course, after his question. He doesn't rebuke Philip harshly. Instead, he corrects him with patience and with love. He gently reveals his identity again for probably the thousandth time, saying that to see him is to see the Father. Jesus is patient with us when we fail to to understand or when our faith is weak he desires us to know him fully but he also checks us when we misunderstand something we got to get it correct you should not fear jesus correction but take that as an invitation to know him more to get closer to him this also just highlights jesus's unity with the father jesus's unity with the father is actually one of the most profound spiritual truths of the christian faith jesus isn't just a representative of god or a prophet he is the very image and presence of God, and it is through him that we see the Father. Understanding the divinity of Jesus is essential to our faith. Jesus and the Father are one, and it's through Jesus that we have access to the Father. Our personal relationship with Jesus is key for us to experience and know God fully. So with that being said, we should trust in Jesus' divinity and his authority. Jesus is the way and the life to the Father. When we are uncertain or we need direction, we need to look towards Jesus, knowing and believing that he has the authority to guide us to God. So in those moments when you have doubt or you have a challenge, you need to reaffirm your trust in Jesus' divinity. Remind yourself that through him and through his authority, you have access to the Father and his guidance is sufficient enough for you. God has a desire to be known by you. Jesus' statement that whoever has seen me has seen the Father reveals that he wants to be known. It is through Jesus that God has made himself accessible to humanity. The fullness of God's love and his character is embodied in Jesus. He has made himself known in a way that is personal and relational to us. And we can experience the fullness of God through a relationship with Jesus. And we can rest in assurance that God is present. Philip's question actually suggests that he was seeking more of God's presence. But Jesus reassures him that he already has God's presence through Jesus. This ultimately teaches us that we should recognize God's presence in our lives instead of rather focusing on external signs and miracles and evidence. So practice being aware of God's presence in your daily life. Instead of seeking constant external confirmation, signs, miracles, or whatever you look towards to, to have evidence that God is present in your life, just trust and have faith that Jesus is with you. 
and through him, you have access to God's peace, comfort, and love. And now let's get into Philip's life after Jesus' ascension and ultimately his martyrdom. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so after Jesus ascends into heavens and leaves us with the Holy Spirit, period. Let me stop. After <laughs> Jesus' resurrection and his ascension into heaven, of course, all the disciples spread out to spread the word. Early church tradition states that Philip preached in places such as Scythia. Uh, okay, listen, what you're not going to do, I already stated I'm going to butcher this. Okay. Scythia, which is actually modern day Ukraine. He went to Samaria, Gaza, Greece, Phrygia, Phrygia. Yeah, I don't know. And Syria. Okay. One significant tradition places him in Hierapolis, which is actually modern day Turkey. This is a Greco Roman city um, where he played a prominent role in establishing the Christian church. Tradition states that he performed many miracles in this place. Um, it also states that he killed a serpent that the people in that time were worshiping at the time. And so that actually converted a lot of people once they saw that he had the power to kill the serpent. Again, this is outside of scripture, outside of the Bible. So everything should be tested and bested. Church history states that Philip was actually martyred in Heropolis in 80 AD. According to most sources, Philip was also crucified upside down like Simon Peter. It's not really going into detail about if he requested to be martyred this way. But then again, there are some traditions that say he was rather stoned to death instead of crucified. And they say that this stoning took place after he converted a prominent leader's wife to Christianity. It kind of resembles the story of Andrew's death as well. Overall, we should all seek understanding with persistence. Philip's desire to know Jesus and the Father more just encourages us to seek clarity through our faith journeys. Continue to ask questions, even some that might seem uncomfortable or some that might seem stupid. And overall, introduce others to Jesus. Share his love. Don't be stingy. Everybody need a piece of Jesus. In the description box below is a list of resources I use to make these episodes. I will be continuously adding things to this list as I make more episodes. And if you have some resources as well that you use and that you think will be helpful for me and the, your community, go ahead and leave it in the comment section below and make sure that it is accurate. Don't be putting stumbling blocks in front of people's face, nah. So I actually have another question. Why did Jesus choose a flawed fisherman like Simon Peter to be a leader in the early Christian church? You can click on this video to find that out. Also, I did a video on Andrew if you're interested in that. Subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss out on next week's episode on Friday where I talk about Nathaniel. My final words to you. Let God do his part. Peace.